issues related to quality and access and, and uh, sharing some new resources and updates to our quality, quality uh, cost of preschool quality and revenue tool. Um, if there are any logistical issues, Tracy Jost is on standby, uh, ready to assist you. Please put the technical issues in the chat box. Any questions you have related to the content or the presentation, go ahead and put in the question box as they occur to you, and we'll be checking that throughout. The session is being recorded, and the slides and the handouts will be, will be posted on CELO.org. We really hope you enjoy this webinar, that it's informative to you, and feel free to reach out to us through the chat or the question box as needed as we spend the next hour together. The objectives of the webinar are to increase our awareness and understanding of the policy issues that are impacting costs, raising revenue, uh, with the National Academy of Sciences study on financing quality just recently released a few weeks ago, and our increasing attention to ensuring um, equity in access to high quality early learning. There are very strong policy drivers to the work that uh, we're trying to do to build our capacity and understanding of costs of quality. Uh, we want to increase your knowledge of the tools and resources that CELO is developing, joining the suite of tools and resources from a variety of other technical assistance providers. And we'll, we will spend some time increasing your understanding of how to use um, our particular tool, and we'll have a demo at the end. So today, Steve will kick us off by situating us with uh, in, in the policy issues, looking at some data on quality and access. We'll provide an overview uh, online to the actual tool, breaking it apart in terms of the preschool quality cost part, and we've um, significantly revised both the revenue side and the kind of navigation uh, of the tool and we uh, have a variety of new resources on our website. For those who really, um, really want to get inside the guts of the tool, uh, we will stay online and do an online demo of the tool, and feel free to stay on or get off as, as your needs arise. Well, I'm going to um, now do a quick poll. Uh, it's on the screen, but I'm going to actually do this online, so give me a moment. So we're distributing it. Do you see it? <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, great. If you have other pressing um, questions that wasn't one of the um, options, you may use the chat box to let us know what those are. We really, you know, to want to hear from you as we can. Okay, so how we share that, I am not so sure. So we're gonna see if that worked out. Okay, it's still collecting responses. And I see that um, it looks like 56% looking to increase the number of children and um, a little bit 54, very similar percent looking to project funds and revenues over the next five years. That's perfect. Our tool is really designed to be a cost projection, strategic planning kind of tool. So still, I'm going to go ahead and close it now. And it says you can share. Can you share? You can see those results now. Yep, they're there. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much. Oh, okay, we've got about 37% uh, very high looking to increase staff qualifications and compensation, I'm sure, and then meeting the new quality benchmarks. Alrighty. Um, well, fortunately, this tool and our technical assistance and support um, was actually designed around those burning questions, and we're hoping today to share with you both some data and some resources and some approaches uh, to helping you to answer those questions specifically for your state or community. I'm going to introduce Steve Barnett. As you know, he is the senior co-director and founder of the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers University. 
He's also the PI on the Center on Enhancing Early Learning Outcomes, longtime colleague of uh, myself and Jana and many of you in the field, really led the work uh, to establish quality standards for preschool. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you and I'll, I'll move your slides for you. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, if uh, you can move to the next slide. The, I want to start with an overview of, of why we need cost and revenue analysis because um, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, and I think that creates uh, some problems. Um, I think we, we all know that, that preschool can enhance quality of life in the early years and build this foundation for later success. But that really only happens if programs are of high quality. And unfortunately, most programs, public and private, fall short of high quality. One of the reasons for that is too often we start by setting our cost and then we design rather than starting with our design for success and then costing that out. Um, so this is, I think, a major stumbling block in the field. In addition, I think we can also encounter implementation problems if we don't appropriately plan um, taking into costs and revenues into account. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that despite the is that often we assume that costs and revenues um, are fixed and um, and don't change from place to place, time to time. Uh, and it turns out it, it doesn't really work like that. In fact, they systematically change as programs expand. And if that's not planned for, it creates some serious implementation problems. All right, next slide. So this summarizes data from uh, 2005. I wish we had more recent data. And on the other hand, I wish I had a reason to believe things had changed appreciably since 2005, and I don't. Um, but this is the last time we had a national study of observed quality. The, the blue bar gives you the percentage of four-year-olds enrolled in any kind of center. Uh, and you can see it increases with income as you move from up through middle high to high, but it's fairly high even for low income kids, not nearly as high as, as all of us would like. Um, but if we then ask what percentage of kids were in high quality programs, and, and that is here defined as at least a five on the Eckers. You can see, even for the highest income families, less than a third of kids are in programs that score that high. And, and for the lowest income kids, it's less than 20%. And um, so that's, that's a serious cause for concern. And, and I think the reasons that we have this quality pro problem uh, are go back to, design failure and implementation failure. All right, next slide, please. And this, this is um, some newer data uh, for Head Start. I'm not picking on Head Start um, because I think it's an example of um, lower quality. I'm picking on Head Start because they systematically collect data on quality and they're actually some of the higher quality programs out there. So, so this is data on every program in the country, looking at observed quality on the class, and in particular, whether instructional support passes, uh, meets at least a research-based threshold of three, seven-point scale, on average in a state. 
and and the the red states are the places where that doesn't happen and the green states are the places where it does happen and the dark green states and you can see there's only two of them are the states where we're really confident that it happens so so even in one of our better funded programs with higher standards we can see there's a real serious quality problem okay um next slide i think it, what immediately follows is is how do we get high quality and um so these are basically the the features that research points to high expectations and and what that means in practice is is in terms of state policy is high standards for what we want kids to learn and what we want teachers to be able to do. Strong teachers, small classes, uh, because the key to, again, high quality is individualized attention and work in small groups. And it's very difficult to spend much time doing that if your classes are big. Individualized professional development for teachers in their in the classroom that addresses the daily details of their practice. I put a question mark for full day because the the research is a little less clear about the impacts of dosage. Uh, personally, I think that's because of the various ways in which duration and intensity can interact not because more isn't better um, other supports for children and teachers um, it, and having a continuous improvement system and these are in fact the the research base behind this is what leads to the the 10 benchmarks in the state of preschool yearbook and um, to our recent revisions of these, much of which is focused on continuous improvement. We could go to the next slide. And this slide gives you a sense of where we are in terms of two of the things that we think are keys to improving quality professional development and having a continuous quality improvement system. Um, the green states, again, uh, are, are not very frequent as in our last map. Those are states that have both strong professional development and strong continuous improvement systems. Then the yellow states are the states that, that meet the benchmark for continuous quality improvement systems. And, and the states in red are those that have neither. Okay, so next slide, please. If we look at the resources that states allocate to implement a quality program, right? So we look at what do states spend per child? We see that there's this huge variation. Uh, New Jersey's Abbott program and Washington DC spend over $16,000 annually per child. The lowest states, and, and there's a, a list of six of the lowest, that spend under $2,500 per child. And yet all states have similar goals for learning and development if we look at their, at their state standards. Um, now, the, these, these low, low st spending states also have fairly high standards for um, teacher degrees, except um, for Colorado and Florida and uh, for class size. And these are keys, these, these two elements together drive a lot of cost. So you, then that raises a question about uh, the adequacy of, of state funding to meet the needs of a program as defined by the goals you're trying to attain and the standards that you've set. Now, it is, we have to recognize that most states rely on, on blending and braiding local and federal dollars. So it's not just state dollars. 
that's the revenue part of the CPQ and R that we're trying to, to, to bring that back in. And it's also worth recognizing that one of the differences between the high spending and low spending states is whether it's a full or a half day program. Uh, but that's these factors by themselves, it turns out, are not enough to explain this big difference. They do explain some of it, and having a tool to figure that out and help plan um, is important. So next slide, please. Um, if we look beyond quality, um, we also have an enrollment problem. So that, that first slide I showed you about, well, so we have a lot of kids in programs, but most of them aren't in high quality programs. But yet it's also true that many of the kids are not enrolled in programs. And you saw that about half of all low income kids were not in the program um, of any kind, not just state pre-K. Well, um, that 50% figure is an interesting one because nearly half of all public school children are in low income households. So even if you had a, a targeted rather than a universal approach, you'd like to see enrollment pushing 50%. Well, we have 10 states that are about 10% or more of their four-year-olds enrolled in state pre-K. At the other end, we have 20 states that have less than 10% of their kids, uh, including the five that don't really have a state-funded pre-K program. So you can see there's a vast room for growth at the bottom, and, and indeed most states um, have a need to expand preschool enrollment, even to reach all kids in low-income households. Now, one of the things that's been interesting is that that's not necessarily because states aren't trying to expand enrollment. And recently, we've been hearing from a number of states that even when they've appropriated funds to expand enrollment, they're having trouble with take up. And this is a particular problem that we think the, the CPQ&R can help with. I'm going to talk about some of the other problems as we Go to the next slide. As I've already said, the, the, the first thing that the tool is designed to encourage people to do is to design for success first and then figure out what that's going to cost. Um, in addition, the model allows you to move beyond simply having and av one average cost for the entire system to figure out how cost varies with child characteristics and location. And, and this is part of helping to create a fair funding formula. That is a formula that takes into account that from provider to provider, from county to county, one part of the state to another, the cost to meet the needs of kids and families is likely to vary and not insubstantially. And to the extent that you're relying on local resources and not just state funding, local capacity is also going to vary. And planning needs to take both of those things into account. Now, once you've done that, you can determine how many children can you serve at quality within a given budget and begin to make projections for what, how is our budget going to need to change over some period of time to meet our, our goals for expansion over three years, five years, 10 years, whatever your time horizon is. The cpq &R also allows you to examine the impacts of alternative policy decisions, even if you're, we're not looking at an expansion question, we may want to know something like, well, what happens if we change our class size regulation? What would it cost to have pay parity for our teachers if we're having a problem that teachers are leaving our sector for K-12 because we don't have pay parity with K-12? 
or if we have a problem because teachers are leaving private programs for public within pre-K because of a pay or compensation parity issue, which might encompass benefits and not just um, salary. The tool can also help to figure out um, what's an appropriate, what's a workable local share, and what happens to blending and braiding as enrollment expands. So as you all know, there are different eligibility rules for Head Start and child care subsidies, depending on who you're serving, where you're serving, how you're serving them. Um, there are gonna be different intersections between eligibility for Head Start and child care. If you're interested in blending and braiding those funding streams, you need to know how those play out based on how you set your own policies and where you are in terms of expansion Say up the income ladder. And in addition, of course, Head Start and child care dollars are fixed. Um, looks like we're going to be getting a big, as just an aside, big increase from Congress this year for child care. Um, fingers crossed on that one. And anything you're doing to help propel it along, <laughs> I urge you to keep doing it. Um, but um, ultimately, you can run out of these dollars before. Um, you've met the needs of all the kids and families you want to serve. Uh, to the extent that programs depend on in-kind resources of classroom space or shared administration, whether from the public schools or multi-service private agencies, um, you can also run out of those. So figuring out this side of the model what happens to the other resources that you're trying to bring in and use for blending, braiding, and matching is an important part of, of figuring out um, how to scale up, how to expand, how to make best use of the resources to meet your policy goals. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gigi Weisenfeld, and I work at both CELO and NEAR. Um, in terms of my CPQ and our work, I work on providing technical assistance to states who have requested it, as well as developing support materials um, for using it, including a communications toolkit for talking about the costs associated with quality, and some of those tools we'll highlight later. In terms of today, I'm going to provide a quick overview of the CPQ and R, including its functions and organization, as well as touch upon the ingredients of preschool costs and how revenue is calculated within the tool. Next slide. Most important to note is that the CPQ and R is free. Um, later on, Lori will share with you how to request a copy of it. It is an Excel-based model. It is easy to use and modify, especially if you know an Excel, and if not, we're there to help you. The CPQ and R integrates all of the components and their costs associated with implementing the high quality pre-k elements steve just spoke about attached and over if you look in the handout sections there is a handout that provides an overview of the tool that you can also use all of the handouts that we have listed under the handout section are also available on the CELA website next slide there are five major design considerations of the CPQ&R. If we look on the right-hand side, the first one describes how we build costs around preschool quality, standards and benchmarks. I want to emphasize the word preschool quality or preschool. The tool was originally designed really for three and four-year-olds, but it is important to mention that it can be adapted for other age groups. Um, and Lori can talk a little bit more about that later. The feature I find most compelling about the tool, and Steve sort of touched upon this, is that it allows the users to create as many scenarios as needed. The scenarios can be viewed in a side-by-side -side format, such as what happens if you increase access in three years versus five years, or what if you want to calculate the cost differences between reducing class sizes versus increasing teacher salary, I know there was a question about um, funding for space to allow for um, increasing size or having a fully inclusive setting. Those are the kinds of questions that you can pose 
and adapt the adapt variables to really figure out your your answers. The CPQ and R can be simplified and modified, or not. It is extremely flexible and includes preloaded data, making it very easy for the user to get outputs. This chart is also included, along with some other information in the handouts. Thanks, Lori. Next slide. This is almost a data checklist of the major ingredients that should be included in cost. Quality standards, plus data infrastructure costs, plus provider-specific costs. The CPQ&R requires you to assess your data and for you to make decisions about these elements. We have created a checklist to help you with this process available on our CELA website. It is important to mention that there is a lot of state-specific default data included in this tool. So to summarize, the CPQ and R cost components consist of the 10 near quality standards plus nine state infrastructure cost categories plus four provider level costs, equaling 23 different elements. Next. This is an illustrative example of which functions drive costs. Of course, these percentages may vary by geographic region, urban, urban rural setting, etc. But what's important to notice is that salary and wages are the biggest cost driver, which we know, but there's still a lot of other costs that need to be factored in. The CPQ and R can help you create this type of breakdown, which is extremely useful when trying to project what the true cost of high quality preschool is. Next. A new feature of the CPQ and R is the R, the revenue. You see, the tool allows users to look at revenue in a common format, even though these funding sources typically have a unique funding formula and separate restrictions and eligibility requirements. And as Steve mentioned, it's crucial when multiple funding streams are blended and or braided to knowing how to look at it in a common manner. Finally, the CPQ and R contains a number of data tables summarizing state level funding for different funding sources. So if you look on the right hand column of this slide, the user can refer to this list as a first step in brainstorming which sources they may want to consider in building their model. So I've shared a quick overview of the tool, and now I think Lori is going to come up and share some additional resources that are available. Hello. Um, I did. I neglected to say for those that uh, may be new to knowing what the Center on Enhancing Early Learning Outcomes is and our purpose, uh, we are funded by the U.S. Department of Education to work with state education agencies and their partners to build capacity to improve outcomes for young children. Uh, this, we're entering our sixth year of this work, and we realized uh, along the way, many years ago actually, that in order to support states uh, to work both direct, you know, do sufficient planning at the state level and then work with localities in all the different sectors, they really needed a, a, data, a data tool and a data tool that could help them look at the, um, the array of the early childhood system and use the cost data to um, inform their policy making. Many of you may know that are on here that we had a cost of preschool quality tool that we developed a couple of years ago. We piloted it um, in Indiana actually, which was an interesting state to begin the work and we purposely chose that state um, for a couple reasons. One is each of the state agencies, um, education, childcare, uh, and a major uh, uh, provider were really willing to come around, come along the table and really help us think through what was the kind of data that they needed and how could they develop some cost projections. They also had a, a compelling policy reason they had a very. They had no state-funded preschool program. They had some uh, support in the legislature, but a lot of support from providers and other private funders. They really needed good, solid data on what it would cost to expand over time, looking at settings ranging from 
uh, uh, registered ministries, which are more or less registered family, friend, and neighbor care, to group family, child care, preschool, Head Start, Title I. So um, when you go on our website, you're going to see a variety of resources that draw from that work. And then over based on work with Indiana and Kentucky and DC and others, we've developed a variety of different resources and also come to learn more about how to make the tool and the resources user friendly. So on our website, I just want to I want to kind of walk this through walk you through this a little bit and also just to compel you to go and look at the website. One is that the tool is free. However, uh, we do ask you to complete a licensing agreement and a user questionnaire. Once we receive that, we'll then do a demonstration. There's a lot of new information on the website that we've um, revised and made simpler for you to access to understand how to use this tool. In our field, we often um, do not have necessarily either the time or the facility to use Excel to get budget data. We're often looking to other partners to get good data on the size of the workforce, um, where children are, whether they're in full day or half day. Uh, and so it really is um, takes a village to get all the right data. But one of the things that Gigi mentioned is that we tried to make this tool, and you'll see if you stay on for the demo, immediately relevant in that there is a lot of default data in there that, that will, will produce um, estimates for you and cost projections that you could then take out to um, a variety of other folks to kind of vet and or um, improve its validity. And I'll tell you in a minute what we're doing along that um, end as well. Uh, the user guide, again, is broken out. Um, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. But first, you're going to look at your annual slots. Uh, there's a whole section on funding streams, as we've talked about. The quality standards, which have lots of flexibility, even though the default are the 10 near benchmarks, almost everybody would be able to set their quality standards within that uh, re related to whatever your state or your locality is setting for a, a, a ratio or teacher degrees or um, professional development or meals or anything else like that. It does give you um, breakout state level infrastructure and costs. We found uh, that that is often either underestimated or a dart is thrown, thrown at a board and a you know figure like 1%, 2%, 5% without really a lot of methodology and data behind it is often um, often looked at uh, or included um, as the state level infrastructure cost. And we know to both implement, monitor, sustain, and scale up quality, we need infrastructure, we need supports. Um, to work with work, work with programs, collect data, monitor children's progress. So there's lots of resources on there, including a frequently asked question. So a couple of the frequently asked questions that we often get is how much time does this take? And uh, one of the things I like to say uh, for people is that it's as much a data collection tool uh, process as it is a as it is a uh, partner and stakeholder engagement process. Very critical to bring folks around the table, to clarify what your goals are, to come up with um, your objectives, and then to draw everybody through the process of collecting and looking at and using the data, because it's really a, a fantastic forecasting model. We also lear have learned uh, that um, we need to have tools and resources that help us talk about the value, um, talk about the value of pre-K and what does pre-K quality really mean. Uh, we often talk to ourselves and we're quite, you know, we, we're very uh, convinced about the importance of high quality programs. But this toolkit, which was um, funded with uh, the support from the Alliance for Early Success, is really designed to, to help you take your compelling stories data from either our cost tools or other cost tools and cost studies and turn that into a mechanism to talk to others, including legislators and advocates and parent stakeholder groups and business stakeholder groups about why is it important to sufficiently address and um, consider what are the true costs of quality 
even though you may make other decisions about how much money you're going to go go for or what you might use as your you know rate or funding allocation Lori, we had a question that I think you know, either you or Steve may be able to answer. Um, it's from Allison, and she's wondering how, what other states are doing to budget for physical space, as in Alabama, they're having some issues as they're expanding and finding that some of their classrooms and childcare are too small and they are running out of physical space. Uh, Steve, do you want to answer that? Are you on? Can't yeah. yeah, I had um, to unmute myself. Um, and and I'll I'll let you join in. I, I, I think states do a variety of things. Um, some of them conduct needs assessments to see, well, what are the alternatives and, and what are their costs? Um, they um, you know, they look into the uh, the uh, the costs of of a range of of um, what does it cost to modify um, existing facilities? What does it cost to bring in portables? What does it cost to use um, let's call it um, atypical space? So in instead of building uh, a new school. Uh, on public property, uh, can we open it? Open a program in a strip mall that has a, a occupancy problem. Um, so the that goes back to the to the needs assessment. Or I yes, guess I I'll, I'll add in a, a couple. I think this is a really really critical issue in that the tool can help you with. One is to really think through um, whether you in your, you know, either as you're expanding or in, when you're starting up that you build into your funding model startup costs that are about that are for facilities. It also is um, really critical to think about um, how you might leverage or use a variety of different spaces or partners. Now, part of that is is you know very dependent on the structure of your either state or community level preschool or or early care and education program. One of the things is is with the tool that I've found actually in the work that we've done with states is that it actually alerts you to what are issues that you need to be thinking about. So when I do the demo in a couple of minutes, you're going to see that. The tool actually allows you to set for what's the percent of children with um, English language learners that you might that you would be serving, uh, children with special needs, rural, um, rural, you know, percent of rural. So it really allows you to kind of, as you go through the tool, it's a tickler for we need to be thinking about what are the associated facilities costs for for serving children with special needs, for example. And we just went through a study in Kentucky where they have a half day preschool program for um, low income children and then a full day for children with challenging special needs. So that triggers both expansion in the, you know, in the number of, uh, you know, number of staff they need and a variety of other things. So um, again, this is a tool that, that can help you be more deliberate and help you have good information to um, get all of your fantastic thinkers around the table to problem solve. As you know, it won't it won't solve the problem that we don't have enough money in the system. Uh, but we believe it's incredibly important to one uh, base the program, as Steve said, and I and I really 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 appreciate the way he talked about it. Is to design the program for quality, then and understand all those policy and the research base for that. Then to project the true cost of quality. With that data, then you have um, the kind of proper tools, if you will, and proper information to then turn that into a strategy, a strategy for how you might decide to begin or scale up or expand, how you might address um, the the, the diversity and access 
whether that's because of a certain, you know, not having enough programs in certain areas or needing more transportation. I think once you get to a critical mass, then you're again thinking about how, um, as Steve was saying, as you're really trying to go for, you know, maybe 80%, 75% of kids being served, then you're really looking at some other issues that you might have to build in incentives for. So the tool is extremely helpful for forecasting what you need to think about from the policy perspective as you plan to address the needs. Tracy, this is very helpful, and I have to say it's very helpful for you to just let us know if there are other questions that we should be answering. Maybe we could talk about how you would organize um, organize yourself and what questions you would think about while using the CPQNR. Um, well, there is a document that um, that I think you put in there about orienting yourself, but I, I do think that one is you need to, you know, one have a compelling set of questions <laughs> and then you need to get the right people around the table. Um, we found it to be most successful when you have um, either, you know, state agency heads that um, that control funding and or other key stakeholders or private funding funders, excuse me, around the table to make some of these decisions. And then there is a, a core group that is going out and getting the data, producing some preliminary cost projections that then go back to a kind of a steering committee to make some decisions. So I will, I will say that. Um, one thing that uh, I will tell you that we're doing, this is a work in progress, and we continue to learn from every state we work with. You're able to use the tool on your own. We do do a demo. We are available for guiding you through uh, the use of the tool. We work on, uh, this tool was created with the, uh, with the very able um, expertise of 3SI, third sector intelligence. George Rickus is on the phone. He's become um, a very trusted colleague. We will do a demo in a couple of minutes. Um, but we are, uh, for example, we are developing a case study, uh, you know, for the issue of serving toddlers. What else would you have to think about as you go through developing costs to serve that age range? We're doing study of an administrative, at the administrative level, what are the functions and the, and the um, uh, budget that you should keep at the state level to manage quality? Uh, we're doing that uh, with the, the state of Washington. If uh, we have a new budget tool that actually we haven't even publicly released yet, but we're about to, if anybody is interested in participating and piloting that budget tool around looking at what are the state administrative costs around quality, around data collection, around policy analysis, around uh, managing contracts, uh, let us know. We'll be working on that. And then we're about to engage into a thorough review of all of the default research, uh, default data in our tool, looking at areas that we could um, improve. There's a number of people that have done cost studies and we want to make sure that we're using the best metrics uh, for any of the variables that we have in our tool. So I'm going to uh, let you know that you will get a survey, you will get all of the materials from the, from the webinar. Uh, if there's any other closing questions, for those that are interested, we're actually going to go to an online demonstration of the tool in a, in a couple of uh, seconds. So I'll stop for a minute and see if there's any other uh, questions while I um, pull up my uh, uh, actual tool. Alrighty, so if you want to stay on now, then you will go ahead with the demo, but I'm having a tiny problem with getting my, um, I hope I don't mess anything up. Let me just see. Okay. All right, so let me just see. No. Did I mess anything up? Okay. 
Oh no, my computer has frozen. So I might have to turn this over to George to do the demo because I cannot get my um, this thing off here for some reason. Let me see. All right, let me see if you can see this. You can see your screen, Lori. Okay, good. Okay, you can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. All righty, good. Okay, so presuming now those folks are on are really kind of the data geeks, and you'll really want to see the tool. So um, what I'm gonna I'm gonna enlarge my screen a little bit. One thing that we've added that is a, a big improvement is um, is this home screen. And it allows you to kind of serve as your navigational tiles, I suppose, if you will. And um, you are able to use this to, oh gosh, okay, there we go. Sorry, I had to, I had to hide the control panel. So this navigational uh, home screen is one that you can use very flexibly. And as you'll notice, there's more or less five kind of buckets or categories of data and information that this tool will be um, using. You begin with the annual, with the slot plan, and I'll go to that in a minute, but right now I just wanna orient you to something. Um, we usually ask people, even though funding is next, to go ahead, do your slot plan, then to choose what quality standards you want to use and model. You do not have to use all of the 10 quality standards and you can revise them based on your either your QRIS or your state quality system, whatever you would like. It will be drawing from and producing uh, and calculating state infrastructure costs and provider costs and I'll show you that in a moment. A couple of other buttons, we mentioned this word scenario. What's really valuable about the tool is that you can compare side by side two scenarios, which are basically policy options. So by pressing this button, I'll show you in a minute what happens, but it means that the, um, the tool has created a side by side option for you so that you can compare, I'm going to just say, you know, full data, uh, half data, full day, or expanding over time and what those increased facilities would cost. This button unhides all the sections. Just because the tool is quite detailed, um, we've hidden the sections, and I'll show you in a minute. Um, but sometimes you wanna you wanna see that. Um, so I'll I'll show you that in a moment. But this this allows you to kind of flexibly manipulate the data in uh, the implementation plan B. This is highlighted <laughs> here. Basically, we consider this the workhorse. This is where you enter a lot of data, and I'll go to that in one second, but I want to show you tab A, which is the summary. So as you're entering in implementation B, you're going to see, oh, I guess I didn't move out what I had <laughs> used before, but anyway, um, when you get it, it, it will be a blank, and you'll this will start to produce some data that you'll see here. You'll see the uh, summary data, you'll see the total annual implementation costs, you'll see the funding surplus, you'll see it break broken out by disaggregated information, fully loaded costs and that whole thing. You'll get budgets for different sectors, so typical line item budgets. This is again um, useful, very, very useful to um, bring to your steering committee or your various sectors to show them how these total summary fully loaded costs then have meaning and break out for different sectors. Down here is an area again for you to take notes and um, note you know whether you may or may not be using all of the data. It's just a way for you to keep track of um, how you use the tool. This um, true false piece means that for those uh, cells that have a formula and or have some logic assumption 
if you've entered the data correctly, it will be true. If you have not or haven't used it yet, it'll be false. It's just a, it's just again a way a tickler for you to go and vet, if you will, the data. And as you can see, um, this is a similar side by side for that second scenario. So uh, one of the first things you do um, when you get the tool is that I have already gone in and done this, but you will then go in and select whatever state you're from. And that brings in all of the Colorado default data that we have, primarily salary data, but a lot of demographic data that we have entered here. We just updated this last spring. We'll be updating it again, CCDF allocations, a variety of other data. You can see that all of these are, it's drawing from, uh, for the most part, uh, tab C and tab D when you're getting, when you're getting costs. So as I mentioned, um, you can very flexibly and fluidly uh, oh, one, one more thing before I go off. If it's green, the cell is shaded green. It is an output. If it's shaded yellow, that's you, that is usually something that you enter. And for example, you would name this. I'm just going to say four-year-old Colorado program. I'm going to say, you know, part day. And then you'll see where I made the second scenario side by side. You could see, for example, you could name this whatever you want to compare it to, full day, you know, for all four-year-olds, whatever you'd like. So it gives you that functionality. You can fluidly, for navigation reasons, go back out to the home page now. And I'm going to do this uh, just to show you that uh, one of the quality standards. Many of you are quite interested in um, lead teachers and, and staff qualifications. I mean, you will note that assistant teachers are very important and you can certainly cost model them separately. But for now, I'm going to go to the lead teacher. Hold on one minute. I need to go back for a second. Um, I forgot my own thing because I didn't look at this. But the first thing you do um, after you've set your own state is you want to put your slot plan in. And um, hold on a minute. I just want to adjust this a tiny sec so you can see it. All righty. Um, and, I, and I actually already entered this just to make it a little bit more fluid and easy for you. Um, the base year, again, as we mentioned, you can project over the course of whatever number of years you'd like. Your base year is what you are currently doing right now. We just put, for illustrative sake, uh, child care um, full day is 100 uh, slots, and full day we're counting as six hours. Again, this is where you would want to know both what you're interested in modeling and what data you have at your, at your own state or local level. By the way, um, we divine, designed this for the state. But we have actually um, used it and adapted it in Massachusetts for some of the like collaboratives that are working on the preschool development collaboratives. So regional level collaboratives could take the state level data and adjust that for the region. And then you would still have the provider level cost. Uh, we wanted to model in particular that, you know, many, many folks are interested in moving from part day to full day. So that's why we um, started modeling this uh, scenario, if you will, as we're re reducing the number of part day, increasing full day. So you'll just see here that you get total number of slots. Um, it will give it to you by delivery model. That's the second scenario. I want to point out to you a couple of things that you are able to adjust. You're able to adjust, and this is going to become important when George does the revenue, um, the uh, federal poverty level. Hold on, did I get there? Oh gosh, sorry. This always goes so much smoother when you're doing it on your own and not in front of everybody. But in essence, you are able to adjust the federal poverty level. You're able to adjust the percent of children with ELL, percent of children with special needs. This is not in the model linked to um, a cost, a weighting or a cost differential. You can, however, 
use that as a way to build that in and tie it to, for example, um, an ELL teacher in your in your teacher calculations. Or for rural, you can tie it to um, increased transportation costs. The other uh, piece that we recently modified here to be more realistic about, you will get um, the dosage um, in terms of no the number of teachers that are needed and the number of calendar weeks. And we recently um, did this variation so that you could look at, at the number of holidays and or in-service days that you might need to then think about having a substitute for or other, other costs related. Again, as I mentioned to you, you, a lot of this is default. Some of it is a tickler or a reminder of what are the costs you should really be thinking about. And I will say that this is a cost, remind you that this is a cost projection, a strategic planning tool, um, really trying to think as, as um, both strategically and systemically about what are the real costs of high quality programs. So now I'm gonna go back out there because I wanna just show you real quickly when um, you're looking at, again, a quality standard, the kinds of things you would be looking at based on the slot plan, if I had not put any slot plan, no numbers would be showing up here. The slot plan then drives, drawing from the default data, you can see here, it gives you a hint here, this percent of lead teachers with the BA degree is drawing from Head Start data, which is the best national data we had available that we could draw in. You may and possibly do have better data that you could use to adjust adjust this but this gives you more or less better than back of the envelope but something you might want to decide to do additional research on you'll see there is there that this is projecting the number of a uh, number of teachers with ba degrees in year zero in uh, number of uh, teachers in year zero and then how you can be projecting costs over time um, as you both have teachers leaving the workforce, see the future workforce assumptions, or you're beginning through an incentive or other mechanisms to bring more teachers up to a BA degree and fewer teachers in, you know, fewer teachers see hired with an AA degree. So that, I just wanted to point that out to you, just so you see the um, both utility and the complexity of the tool um, is, is again, something that really helps you think through what, you, what we need to do to project quality costs. So I'm gonna actually now go back out and turn this over. I hope I can do this, Jana, too. Um, okay, I know what I've gotta do. Hold on a moment. Uh, let me actually uh, see if there's any questions that anybody has that um, got in the chat box that I can't see right now. Lori, can you talk about whether we um, states could change any of the default assumptions that are set up in the CPQNR, such as teacher salaries, if they believe that the teacher salary that's input for the Head Start, um, driven by the Head Start data, might be higher or lower than what is actually um, being implemented in the state? Yes, you can. I'm turning this over to George now, and you're going to see his screen for a minute because he's going to show you the revenue part. But you can um, override uh, the default data and put in your own. Uh, George can talk more about that. And again, the user manual. And, and um, if you saw that section on the website, there's more or less some uh, documents for advanced users. But none of the cell, very few of the cells are right protected. There are a few now that are, but I'm gonna let George go ahead um, and chat more, unless Tracy, you had another question, but let me turn this over to George now. Thanks, Lori. Can everyone hear me all, all right? You're good. Great. Um, so yes, as Lori was saying, um, very few cells are right protected in this Excel file. So you can change uh, any of the default assumptions uh, based on your own data. And in many cases, we tried to anticipate where you do that and actually built in uh, the ability to, to scale an assumption up or down into the, uh, the format of the assumption itself. 
So George, what I'm going could I ask you to um, make your screen the full screen so people can see it? It's oh. it's not full screen just yet. Um, I'm looking to see where to do that. I'm sorry. All right, D don't don't don't. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, so uh, this is, as, as Lori was saying, the, there's the revenue side of the model, which we wanted to give you a quick demo of. And as you can see, I have the same slot counts that Lori had entered in in her demo of the model, where we have slots in full day care and part day care across three delivery models, um, actually a shift towards more full day over time under public pre-K and a growth in private child care centers, but Head Start remaining the same. So if I were to use the revenue model and wanted to now build funding to go along with uh, this, this cost information that we've now estimated, um, I could go to the home page and then click on the funding stream section. And this takes me to, the, to this section, this table of the model. I'm gonna scroll down to the main uh, point, uh, the main table for entering your funding assumptions. A uh, key feature of this funding model, um, as mentioned earlier, is the ability to model um, widely varying funding streams side by side, which is particularly useful in situations where you're blending or braiding funding. Um, and equally important, we are able to tie um, these assumptions around funding to the volumes that are being used in the cost model. So you now have a budget model and a cost model which are, which are in alignment. So as you change assumptions, um, both will um, will uh, change accordingly. So just really quickly, if I were to characterize what the slot example Lori had done and illustrate the features on this tool, as I mentioned earlier, she included Head Start funding. The uh, default version of this tool has a list of funding in, in the left uh, side of this table. I've deleted those because they're included really just for illustrative purposes. So what I'll put in is I'll put in federal Head Start funding. Um, let's assume through research and, or knowledge that we know that this funding in the state of Colorado for this particular slot plan um, is, is statewide and, a, and available at a level of um, $3.2 million. Um, since Lori entered slots in over uh, through year two, we have it going through, the, through year two. We also know that 100% of these funds are going to providers, um, Head Start funds, uh, there's a child eligibility restriction of less than 130% FPL. So by specifying that, you actually are able to link to some assumptions that are made above this table where you can actually break out your target population um, by child el eligibility. So you can make a little bit more detailed assumptions around the number of children you're expecting to serve that are below 130%, for example. And since this is Head Start, um, we selected delivery model restriction of Head Start and now we have funding um, that is now uh, being contributed for the Head Start side. For uh, the other two delivery models, I'm gonna very quickly enter in for child care centers and public pre-K. Um, let's say there's a hypothetical um, state pre-K program funding. And let's say that we know that that is a per child funding amount and in the amount of $6,950 per child. And again, uh, that's for now we're assuming that's holding steady over the life of the, of the cost model that we're building. We know that there are only 95% of this, these funds are passed through to providers. The other 5% are being uh, applied to state level admins. So I'll enter in 95% there. And this has a, the, this state pre-K program has a different eligibility threshold of 185%. And what I'm gonna do very quickly, since this doesn't apply to Head Start, I'm gonna say that this, uh, that this applies, sorry, that this applies to child care centers. And then I'm going to do the exact copy, because you can actually copy these, and do the exact same row, but now I'm going to have this apply just to the public pre-K slots. So now we have, what I've done really quickly is shown Head Start and state pre-K program funding. Um, and being able to model those side by side using a common format. If I draw your attention up to the top row where we show the available funding and funding surplus, you'll see that in year zero, 
we pretty much netted out, but as a result of changing dosage and expanding the program, we're looking at a shortfall. So just as a, another quick example to show how you could use this, use this in somewhat of a braided funding or blended funding scenario, you could add, let's say, hypothetically, we want to add CCDF funding to help make up the shortfall. And again, we done, we identify an amount of $2,000 per child. And we have that beginning year one. And it has a similar pass through of 95%. Um, although this doesn't change the results too much, you have a drop down menu of eligibilities. We just happen to know for CCDF, it's less than 85% of state medium income. And there is no eligibility restriction from by delivery model. So now what you see is by adding that $2,000 in funding, we've been able to meet the funding requirements in year one, and yet we're still short in year two. And so you can see how this model can be used to identify funding surpluses, funding shortfalls. Um, there's, a, there's a number of tables that I won't go through too quickly that are below this that allow you to see where your shortfall is occurring. It could be occurring in just one of your delivery models or even at the state admin level. But I hope this is a good illustration of uh, how easy it is to, to add these funding lines and have it integrate with the cost model and the assumptions you're making on that side of the CPQ and R. Lori, back to you. Thank you, George. Sorry, had, um, yes, please sorry, go ahead. Had, yeah, we had one question, and we wanted. And the question is: Is there information for every state, even those that don't have state-funded programs, such as Utah? Yes, there is. <laughs> and actually, we added um, because we started working in District of Columbia last year, and we realized we didn't have them in there, so we added them as well. So yes, there is, in, you know, information for every state. Um, that that isn't to preclude or in to imply that that every piece of data in here is as thorough as you, as you might need. I, th I think we want to emphasize that we are in the process of updating the the kind of the methodology and the and the data, and there is data that we feel most confident in. There's data that we expect you're going to have better data potentially at the state, you know, salary data, you would possibly and probably have better data either at the state or local level, especially, especially if you've done a workforce study. And there's other areas that we really are intending to do additional research or that not too many people know very much about, right? Um, there's certain things like some coaching models, some curriculum, there's such a range that uh, we, you know, that you will need to either do that or make an educated um, decision based on the cost. So, other questions, Tracy? I think that's it. Maybe you can just talk about um, after they um, sign up to get a license, then what, then what are the next steps? Okay, so what happens is you will go on uh, the website and uh, and I would do that next and get the licensing uh, agreement and the information form and that you submit that to Carol Contreras and then she lets me know. We schedule a demo, like we actually have a demonstration tomorrow for Alaska. And uh, we will demo the tool and then you will get the tool. Um, we don't give out the tool without the demo because, as you can see, we just want to make sure you have some support in understanding it, but mostly we want to have a relationship with you so that we can understand and use and help you along the way. Um, then uh, we'll make decisions about we are available to answer some questions and support you. Uh, CELO can provide some TA to states more intensively. Right now, we're working very intensively with a few states, Oregon and Washington, um, and we'll possibly do a couple of others. And uh, 3SI and George is available as well, um, in part through us and in part through FIFA service to work with states. If you don't have staffing or capacity, or you need the you need the you need the projections really quickly. Um, you know, there's certainly ways to go about um, having really excellent support uh, to to do the cost projections. So I want to thank everybody who stayed on for the demo and to know that we're available for your support and information at any time. You can submit questions through info at silo.org 
or reach out to any one of us. So I hope you have a fantastic day. I want to thank Gigi and Steve, Jana, Tracy, George, um, and all the staff and participants uh, for be, uh, spending this last a little bit more than an hour with us. And all the materials will be on our website. We look forward to working with you, helping you to craft good policy and having the sufficient resources so that all children have access to high quality early learning programs. Thank you.